Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. We're back to our Sunday night schedules. All is right in the world is Kevin and I have smooth travels. We're going to be talking about Kansas football's 39-232 loss on the road to Oklahoma State. Kevin, I mean, there's a lot to break down here. I'm curious, where do you want to start? Because we can <laughs> skip the pleasantries, Kevin. I don't want, we don't need to go for an hour and a half. Let, let's, let's get to it. Let's start chomping at the bit. Cause I mean, there is so much to break down with this game. So where do you want to start? This is a much better Kansas team than last year. That mm. game looked like last year's Kansas. You know, yeah. when you look at the different parts of uh, falling behind by 14 points to start off the game, uh, when you look at all the explosive plays allowed and allowing the over 500 yards of offense, when you look at the fact that they weren't necessarily uh, the cleanest, when you look at the fact that when it came down to the clutch, when you wanted Jason Bean to make that extra play or so, and Jason Bean played a whale of a ball game. I mean, let, let's be honest here. He played a terrific ball game. But when you wanted that extra play there, when you like last year against Baylor, like last yeah. year against Texas Tech, like so many times, that that play didn't happen, and you come out of it feeling a lot like last year, and that you feel like that was a game that was not just winnable, but maybe should have been won by Kansas with the way things played out. And yet here Kansas is coming back with another loss. What what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to put it. And we probably should just start from the beginning, honestly, because it was a game where I think after three drives, right, taking into account Oklahoma State marching down the field, KU struggling um, after getting one first down, right, Jason Jason Bean misses Mason Fairchild. Then all of a sudden Oklahoma State goes down and scores again, and you're thinking, at least I'm sitting up in the press box thinking, oh, boy, is this going to be the score line? Like we've seen the last few times KU has gone to Stillwater because those scores have gotten out of hand. It's been, sure. I, I think I, I put the number somewhere like an average score of 53 to 13 over the last six trips to Stillwater for KU. And that's what I thought. And it looked just like last season, Kevin, that's so spot on. Right. And I think it's almost different too, because the way that they Oklahoma state attacked KU where I think last year, a lot of what you saw opposing teams do is try and take the top off the defense, sure. right? throw it over the top, go deep, where Oklahoma State, first play of the game, takes advantage of KU's defensive line, which we've talked a lot about, getting upfield and taking advantage of kind of that five, 10 yards of space just kind of around the line of scrimmage and turning that into a big play. And I felt like that was a big theme of the game, Kevin, was that space right in front of the offensive line, kind of five yards in front of the offensive line and kind of like three or four yards behind the offensive line where I feel like Oklahoma State was able to get Ollie Gordon in the run game in space and then get some screens going as well. And I thought it was a really good game plan for them. But that was one of those where at the beginning I was just thinking, oh boy, like <laughs> how how bad could this get? Yeah, I mean, there were, there were definitely jokes about, you know, how uh, – how for Kansas, the game doesn't start until they go down 14 <laughs> nothing. But let's be honest, that hasn't been the case this year. That hasn't been – they haven't been plagued by the slow starts yep. in, in that way. And it's a positive, obviously, that, that they responded, were able to come back, take the lead, all of those different things. The bottom line is you don't want to spot your opponent 14 points. And, and I think one of the difficult things about this, and, and we'll get into the defense specifically, I'm sure – Brian Borland took a lot of heat during that game, as I'm mm -hmm. sure you saw on Twitter. There were an awful lot of times, Swain, where there was a KU football player where he was supposed to be, and he just didn't make a play. And when that happens, I think it's easy to look at a defensive str that struggles and say, oh, the defensive coordinator is bad, whatever mm -hmm. else. All he can do is get chess piece X to location Y. And there were there were some cases where Kansas wasn't there, to be quite frank with you, but there were a lot more cases on those big plays where Kansas was there, somebody was there along with Ollie Gordon and just didn't make the play that they needed to play to get him onto the turf. Yeah, and like first and foremost, like 
hats off to Ollie Gordon. He's a great sure. player. Yeah, he's like, a terrific player. He's he, one of the Brandon guys. Presley's really good. I mean, they're Oklahoma State skill guys are really, really good. And I, I don't yeah. know, I don't know that Oklahoma State got enough credit after that game because of the way things played out. Those were some mm-hmm. really tough guys that Kansas had to account for. And Alan Bowman's a guy that, you know, threw for what, like 600 yards in a game as a freshman. Kansas should have gotten after Alan Bowman, I, I think, better than they did. Mm-hmm. You know, they should have found a way to get more pressure. But at the same time, Bowman is a very capable quarterback of taking advantage of those weapons, too. Yeah, well, so I think you look at Oklahoma State, and I think the team speed that they have at the skill position spots was pretty evident, right? I think it was maybe the second touchdown where – They've got the guy who catches the ball out of the backfield and then just zooms right by J.B. Brown and I believe Rich Miller. And we might have a a broader conversation about the linebackers, um, (laughs) period. But the the overall athleticism and team speed that Oklahoma State had at running back and I think even at wide receiver to some degree um, really caught my attention. And I think it's something that Mike Gundy is smart And they had a really good game plan going into this game where they use some of that up tempo early in the game, right? We've seen how KU's defense struggles against up tempo because I think you mentioned it, Kevin, right? Like Brian Borland can call the right plays, but if guys are half a yard off in their alignment, if you're playing against a guy that's so fast, you know, like an Ollie Gordon or like a Presley, like that puts you at such a huge disadvantage. And Oklahoma State came out and they had a great game plan. And I think adjustment wise then KU did fix some things but generally it just wasn't one of these showings where you felt like it was the defense that you've seen at times this year right where KU has gotten after the quarterback a lot this year the defensive line's been pretty good I think generally KU has been decent in coverage and it just was one of these games where I think they just fell so short and Look, Alan Bowman has a, a career touchdown to interception ratio of about one to one, yeah. and he uh, he basically gave KU two, and yep. they dropped one. Same as the Nevada game. Like, it, I mean, yeah. it, it's you know, it, it was so similar in that circumstance against Nevada because I, I think Kansas has been pretty good about taking the ball away when they've gotten opportunities. Totally. The Nevada game was kind of that outlier, right? Where Nevada fumbles the ball five times throws two passes to KU DBs and turns it over zero times. And, Mm. and, you know, in this one, you know, you didn't have all the fumbles and everything, but Bowman put two right on Kansas defensive backs. They didn't, they didn't catch it. You know, it's funny. I I just looked it up while we were, while we were talking, Alan Bowman as a freshman threw for 605 yards against Houston. (laughs) So, you know, it's uh, say what you want about the, about the Houston defense, but all I'm saying is that's a capable guy if his jersey's clean. If he's feeling comfortable back there with the skill position guys that Oklahoma State has, you know, he he's going to be capable of a big day. And unfortunately for Kansas, you know, we've talked about how Kansas defensively, for the most part, isn't good enough to just take away everything at this point, right? You kind of have to pick and choose and say, hey, you're not going to run the ball on us or or you're this is what Kansas wants to take away. Kansas didn't take anything away this game. Oklahoma state ran the ball. Oklahoma state Mm -hmm. threw the ball at different levels, you know, of the field. I I mean, Oklahoma state for the most part did what it wanted. I, I do think, you know, Kansas did fairly well on third downs, you know, not quite 50%. And, you know, some of those came early where I think that, you know, they, they got a little bit better at that as uh, as things went along but overall you know they just he, you if you would have said before the game hey Oklahoma State's going to have 554 yards of total offense you would have said Kansas is going to have a tough time winning this game totally right and i think this is if you're going to pick right the games that you want your defensive line to be healthy and your pass rushers to be healthy at least in the first kind of seven games of the season right i think you'd pick BYU having Keaton Slovis, who's kind of a statue. And I think you'd probably pick Oklahoma state because Alan Bowman is, he can move around a little bit, but he's more or less a guy that wants to be in the pocket. And KU comes into this game. Hayden Hatcher doesn't make the trip. He's got an injury that 
We'll see if he's even available for Oklahoma. Austin Booker gets hurt during practice this yeah. past week and shows up to the game with his his knee taped up like to all get out, and then he's got a huge brace on the top of it. He somehow finds a way to kind of grit through and make a bunch of plays and get nine tackles. Like it just was an overall game, and that's not even talking about Jeremy Robinson, who literally left last week's game against UCF with an injury and didn't practice last Monday, and it wasn't until about Tuesday, Wednesday when he returned to practice. Like, KU was so banged up at defensive end, and Patrick Joyner has given KU good snaps this year, and Dylan Brooks is raw and young, um, but this is not the game where you want those two to be your really your, your healthy edge rushers, you know, and it's Oklahoma State made KU pay, Kevin, because I think you're right. KU has tried their best to make teams one-dimensional. They made BYU one dimensional. They took away the speed that UCF had. And I think in the games KU has played well defensively, they've just taken one half of the game plan away. And they couldn't do it because against the run, Oklahoma State was able to get hat on hat. And then it's a one on one opportunity where KU's linebackers didn't show up. Yep. And they weren't good and they missed tackles. And and then you get in the passing game and they keep going to one side, right? Kevin, again, it's another game where one side of the field gets targeted time and time again, and the other side doesn't. You know, it's just one of those games where it's really hard to live with when the opposing team can just do that. Yeah, that's that's really tough. And it's kind of funny, you know, you talking about, you know, how banged up they are and everything, because I'm pretty sure on this exact podcast last year, we talked about KU's bye week maybe coming one week too late. And KU may be losing an extra game last year because they were they were just a little too banged up and they needed that bye week to come, you know, sort of a, a week earlier. Obviously, with the bye week being situated where it is, it could prove to be advantageous for that Oklahoma game. You have two weeks to work on Oklahoma, two weeks to heal up, two weeks to potentially get Jalen Daniels back, a lot of different things there. Yeah. But in terms of from a win-loss standpoint, I think this was the game where you started to see kind of Kansas break down a little bit physically to where you said, man, you know, they they kind of really butted up against that bye week and maybe it should have come a week earlier to to help the yeah. team. Yeah, I, I kind of agree, but look, it's still really, you know, sure, you, you got guys it. out there playing, right? And they yeah. you you can still make plays while you're banged up, you know, and I obviously like we're not football players, Kevin, and it's hard, right? Yeah. Playing through that stuff is hard, but it's still a game where I think we could probably switch to linebackers now where I think you just saw that, you know, they just got targeted and it wasn't great. You know, Craig Young did not have a great game. And I think he's been quietly okay this year. Not a lot of splash plays, but I think on the other side of things too, he's just, you know, he's asked to do a lot. And I think a lot of that work too has kind of been, under the radar this year because he's not getting targeted a lot. Well, he got targeted a lot out of the slot. That didn't look great. Um, I think J.B. Brown probably acquitted himself the best of the linebackers, and even then he missed some tackles. Rich Miller wasn't great. Tywin Berryhill wasn't great. And it's just a group that when they're all healthy and playing well, I think they can be good. But I think really you look at it, what, over the last kind of, you know, three weeks really, you know, Texas – you know, some of the runs they were able to hit was because KU's linebackers were out of place. You go back to last week, they were fine against UCF, but not a bunch of splash plays. And then this week, it's another kind of just meh game. And I think that's one of the big reasons why the defense struggled is because the linebackers were a half step off. And like I mentioned, right, Oklahoma State is a team speed to make you pay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you brought up the Texas game too, because I feel like a lot of the stuff that, Ollie Gordon was successful with, you know, were similar situations to what Kansas saw with Jonathan totally. Brooks, where it was a one-on-one -on -one situation and Kansas lost that situation. And, and I, I think that's the tough thing about this is I, I think even beyond taking things away, obviously they want to take things away. Mm -hmm. I think Brian Borland would tell you they don't want to give up explosive plays. You know, they want teams – to have to chop the log over and over and over and over again in order to have a successful drive. Mm -hmm. Just way too many explosives in this one and giving up too many chances. You know, you give up, I think, a 17-yard touchdown and a 20-yard touchdown for Oklahoma State's first two touchdowns. 
Mm. and you're you're kind of you know off on your way at that point oklahoma state averages seven yards of play it, it's going to be tough to win those games even even when kansas you know itself averaged 7.9 mm. yards of play and i'm sure we'll get to the offense here in, in a minute but you know offensively for kansas it, it felt like it was chunks and then maybe a little bit of inconsistency you know it, it felt like oklahoma state was kind of routinely breaking off chunks in this one yeah totally i totally agree and look i think it's also worth noting that KU's defense over a period in the first half too right forced four punts on five drives right so they did right the ship for a little bit sure. and even in the second half right they get put in some really tough positions and they're able to get off the field on third down and i feel like that second half felt so much like the first half against texas where you're kind of look, you're looking at it and you're saying, wow, like KU's defense is actually doing really well for themselves right now. But then, like you mentioned, Kevin, it's so much so similar to that Baylor game where when the big drive happened and KU had to have a stop, they couldn't get it. You know, and it's one of those where KU's defense kept them in the game, right? They they didn't give up 60, 70 points. But it's just one of those where in kind of those big high leverage moments, they just weren't able to get it done. So, I mean, any other final thoughts on defense before we move over to the offense? No, no, I, I think it was uh, – I, I do think they had some positive moments kind of in the fourth quarter to allow Kansas to kind of hang around there at the end. Not saying that they were perfect then, but mm -hmm. – but, but I do think they settled in a little bit. Uh, yeah. Fatigue was a deal, though, too. I, I think I don't think there's any any doubt about that. Anytime you're you're on the field for you know almost 80 plays and you know 80 plays with as many explosive plays and things like that as as they yeah. were, I think you're you're, you're going to tire out a little bit. I mean, 80 plays in in 31 minutes of action, right? This isn't. Yeah the Texas game where it's, you know, 90 plays in 40 minutes. This is 80 plays in 30 minutes. Like Oklahoma state went fast and they, you know, they just went fast and K you really couldn't keep up. So um, I think offensively, I mean, there's so much we can talk about here. Um, you know, it, it was another game where I feel like on the road, Jason Bean does not have a, a good track record of starting fast. I think maybe that Oklahoma game last year where there was a slow start Baylor, obviously a slow start. Um, I think Texas Tech too, like the offense has not traditionally started well on its first drive in road games where I feel like in home games, Kevin, KU's offense tends to start pretty well, right? It feels like they do tend to just generally as a team start better, but then all of a sudden the offense figures it out and they're able to score three straight touchdowns. And I think that was huge because obviously I think momentum at that point in time, obviously KU comes back and, we can talk about point after touchdowns, which I don't think any <laughs> podcast ever wants to talk about PATs, but we're going to have to do it. Um, they often turned it around and they were explosive. Um, what did you think of the way Oklahoma state tried to stop KU? Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was lost sort of in the, you know, the, the Twitter X, whatever you want to call it discourse is a lot of people were like, well, why aren't, why aren't we running the ball? And it had a, pretty good answer because Oklahoma state was taking away the run. You know, I mean, they, Oklahoma state was, was putting guys up there. They, they had guys whose eyes were aligned on the run, you know, quite a bit, which quite frankly is why you saw KU hit two really long pop passes right down the seam is because that guy got frozen, you know, mm -hmm. looking, looking to stop the run. And, and, you know, when you look at, at the speed that Oklahoma State has at the second and third levels as well, I thought Kansas' option game, you know, they really got outflanked a lot. every Just about every time they tried to get outside, it didn't work out. And, and most of their successful runs came, you know, more up the middle. But even then, you're, you're running into, you know, the teeth of the defense, most of the guys there. And, mm -hmm. and you know, if, if it were me, and I were coaching against a Kansas with a, a Jason Bean, even with him throwing for 410 yards the way that he did, I would probably still make the bet that, hey, if we can take away the run game, let's go ahead and do that because the running game, I feel like, has a better chance to beat us than, than Jason Bean's passing game does over the course of 60 minutes. 
Yeah. And I think it was pretty obvious that Oklahoma, I mean, Gundy said it post game, like that was their number one key was Kansas not going to run the ball. And I think this, this three, three stack that Iowa state uses K state uses Baylor uses Oklahoma state's now using it. And this is the theme. KU's offense struggles to run the ball against those type of defenses because it takes away the option game. Cause you've got three guys that are huge. Like if you look at Oklahoma state's three defensive linemen, they had out there for most of the game, they're huge dudes and they do a really good job of plugging holes. So then what happens? You got three linebackers basically ready to fill any gap and make a play on the ball. And KU's option game is a result. Like you can't do much. And that's why the stretch plays didn't work because those linebackers are both able to fill to the outside and go and make a play. And so, you know, Oklahoma state secondary is not very good. They take advantage. If you throw them the ball, like Will Howard did and like Jason B <laughs> did late in the game, right? If you throw them the ball, they're going to catch it. But if you make those guys cover you for 35 dropbacks a game, you're going to be able to throw the ball pretty well. And KU did. And I think it was just a, a sign that KU had a good ability to take what the defense gave, right? And I think they did a very good job of taking advantage of that. And Jason Bean looked confident. He was having, I think, his best game of his Kansas career, and it's not even close. He was playing and throwing the ball with so much confidence. He looked so great. Um, and then the wheels fell off, you know, and mm – -hmm. Well, let's start just with Jason Bean and, the, and let's start with the first three quarters because I think the fourth quarter itself is like a, a whole different conversation to have. But just the first three quarters, I mean, this was a Jason Bean that I don't think you would have seen this type of performance from him in this game in 2021 or last season. Like you saw the improvement. There was touch on the throws. There was confidence. He looked great. Yeah, yeah. And, he, you know, I, I come back to – to one throw in particular, you know, I feel like Jason Bean's first year as a starter, you know, as athletic as he was, he was mostly a stationary thrower. You know, he was a guy mm -hmm. that, that didn't excel when you made him move or you made him uncomfortable. And he rolls out, you know, and puts that ball on Quentin Skinner for mm -hmm. the long touchdown. That was an unbelievable throw. That was one of the best throws Kansas has had all year you know, whether it's Jason Bean or Jalen Daniels. And I think when you when you look at the maturation of of Jason Bean, the way that the way that he's able to throw the ball, mm -hmm. a lot of quarterbacks could, could hit Mason Fairchild, you know, running wide open down the middle of the field. It was some of the other things and the maturity that he had to hold on to the ball for a couple of those deep routes as well, let those things develop. It, it actually wound up um, – hurting Kansas at one point because uh, the the sack that Jason Bean took, you know, sort of over by the end zone, uh, he he had Trevor Wilson down the field, and I think he was trying to give that an extra step to develop it, and that didn't wind up being there because the line kind of shifted to the right. It wound up having a one-on-one -on -one block. Was it Ermaje that missed it? They kind of whiffed on the remember. block and then um, – and then Bean winds up getting sacked. But I, I do think overall his patience was was a real virtue here. And that's not necessarily something that you would have said about him a, a couple years ago. Yeah, exactly. And so I think so much of those first three quarters, right, is super positive because it just shows you the development. And I think that's also encouraging just long term for this staff, right? The ability to develop quarterbacks over time. Right. And someone like Bean, who wasn't super refined coming in and still has his limitations, he's not perfect, but you see the improvement. And I think even so, right. I think some of the wide receivers had really good games. Trevor Wilson's emergence has been a huge positive. Yeah. Mason Fairchild's still very consistent. Um, so I think those wide receivers definitely deserve credit. But then everything really changed when he threw that first interception, just didn't put enough on it. Um, it's kind of one of those touch throws that I think at times Kevin, you and I've talked about the ability to kind of layer it over people. is not something he's super good at. Um, mm -hmm. and that's probably maybe if we're going to talk about next steps in development, like maybe that's the next thing for him is being able to do that more consistently and he fails and there's the interception. And then from there, I mean, it just, it just, the, I it felt like the confidence for Jason Bean really kind of wavered after that. 
Yeah, and I, I, I'll be honest with you. I kind of felt like he should have eaten that ball. You know, I, I, I didn't love the, I didn't love it when, when he let it go. I do think, you know, the, I, I think it was Kendall Daniels in defense that picked that off. I, I did think Daniels was being maybe a little bit handsy there. You know, I, yeah. I but I, I felt like there maybe wasn't a ton of room for him to layer that throw over the top. It was there, like there was the room. But there wasn't a lot of it, and, and I think that it, it was something that that was one that maybe you felt like you know he he should have. I felt like at least maybe he should have held back. You know, you're you're in field goal range. A field goal winds up, you know, putting you back up. I think eight points at that point. I think that was when KU was up thirty-two to seventeen or twenty-seven. Excuse me. Uh, and, and so, and, and there was second down. You know, live to fight another down type of type of deal it wound up being a, a really big play not just you know because they get the the stop there mm-hmm. but because Oklahoma State then goes down the length of the field you know winds up cutting that thing to within two points and, and all of a sudden that pressure kind of keeps rising a, a little bit but yeah I agree with you in that that throw I think up until that interception I don't want to say I felt comfortable because it was a five-point game but you felt comfortable with the way the offense was going right they had 32 points through not even three quarters they had moved the ball back down it looked like they were going to score again and they they didn't ever score again like that was that was the end they went over the rest of the game and so i agree with you and that that kind of seemed like a a huge turning point along with a, a drive that i'm sure we're getting ready to talk about in the fourth in the fourth quarter. Yeah, Kevin, not only did they not score again, I mean, they they they, they got 24 yards yeah. on their next four drives. I mean, 23 yards on the next three drives. Like, everything just dissipated. And I think it goes back to the run game, where K just couldn't consistently run the ball. They'd have one good play from Devin Neal, and then Oklahoma State would do a very good job of consistently stopping KU. And I think the, the, the point you made, Kevin, in the beginning is so, so spot on. Because it's like last year where KU would have a big run and then would run it for two yards, two yards, negative two yards, you know, and it just felt like that was the deal. And then Jason Bean had to go out there and throw and continue to try and beat Oklahoma State. And, you know, this is something I covered in our VIP piece that I I do the good, bad and interesting from every game. And one of the things that I noticed was just the way Bean was reading the defense after that changed, where all of a sudden the ball was being put into tighter windows and it wasn't as much sharpness from Bean, and you saw him try and force throws that were not there, like that for that second interception where he it gets deflected by the defensive lineman. That guy's in the gap where Jason Bean's trying to throw it. Like it's pretty clear that there's someone in between Bean and the receiver, and that's not even factoring in the defensive back that's in the play. And so it just felt like after that, the confidence the way Bean was seeing things wasn't the same as it was through the first three quarters where I thought he was seeing the field really, really well. And obviously from there, if your quarterback isn't really throwing the ball on, you can't run the ball. Like you're kind of out of luck unless the opposition makes a big mistake. Yeah. And you talked about how few yards they had 23 of those yards came on one play that Devin Neal Mm -hmm. run uh, that you talked about. And then of course, you know, you, you then complete the, uh, the pass on the very next down to Trevor Cardell for 20 yards mm-hmm. and Kansas is cooking except that Luke Grimm picks up a personal foul. They, they said it was Devin Neal. It, it was Luke Grimm. Yeah. Um, Luke Grimm to me looked like he was kind of blocking to the whistle a little bit. You can maybe get, you can maybe say, Hey, at that point, just, just let it go. You know, don't, uh, I didn't think it was like a big, you know, cheap shot or anything like that. It, I think you could still say that it was maybe a bad decision to not just let it go. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, you you have a really promising drive um, where you run the ball once, you throw the ball once, and you're at the uh, you're at the thirty. All of a sudden, that thing's back on the forty-five yard line, and you know, we all kind of know what happens next. You know, you go ahead. Yeah, well, so so here, uh, 
Kevin, if that was a KU defensive back and an Oklahoma State wide receiver did that to him, would you would you want a flag to be thrown? I don't know that I would have. I mean, it, it's it's close enough that I get your question. Uh, I'll just put it that way. I, I the problem with it is that I, I think you would need to hear the whistle right in order yeah. to make a determination one way or another. Mm -hmm. But the play was done. It, it was over. And, and so you don't know based on where you're standing, you know, did Luke Grimm see that the play was done? You know, I, I think there are different factors in there, but like I said, like I, you know, just looking at it the way that it was, it probably was the sort of thing where you say, Hey man, in that situation, just, just let it go. Just let it go. And, and, and he didn't. And, you know, that was, Part of what hurt Kansas, but as we're about to get into, you know, wasn't wasn't all that hurt them on that drive. Yeah, I think I'd probably say, hey, you know, I think the the coaching point obviously is gonna be, hey, Luke, like, don't do that. Yeah, um, it's one of those where, yeah, you see it. It's like, mm, it's a, it's it's a soft flag, but you also can't really argue it. Sure, you know, because it's there. Luke Grimm pushes the guy when they're not really involved in the play. Trevor Cardell's on his way down. Like, if you want to argue that it's soft, I, well, I'd back you. It's soft, but it's also one of those things where if you do it right in front of the official, like you're and you're expecting to get away with it. Like, I don't know about that. So, um, there's that. And then yes, let's get into kind of what happens next, where you know Daniel Hushaw gets five yards, and then gets. Um, what is it? Run out of I think right he gets right. one, and then he one gets yard out of bounds. And then runs out of bounds. But then his helmet comes off, so he's got to go out of the play. And then there's like a little bit of a lull in the game. And Lance Leipold said it was his decision to go for it. He was the one that made that call to say, we're doing it. Um, the players said they liked the idea to go for it. And then, um, look, Kevin, from my perspective up in the press box, I mean, we had a decent angle at it. The guy was off sides. Yeah. He was. And if you want to try and show me that, you know, I can't because I don't want to get copyright stuff from Fox for those watching on YouTube. But if you try and don't come at me with this screenshot that, oh, he's on sides because depth perception is a real thing. It exists in the way the camera is pointed. You're going to get the angle where he's going to look like he's not on, not off sides. And then if you were to look down right down the line, you know, you'd see it. It's like in soccer. I mean, I'm a big soccer fan. You see it with the VAR stuff where they draw the lines and then fans are like, well, but the lines aren't straight. Yeah, because you're looking at it at an angle, yep. you know? And so, yeah, the guy was off sides. They didn't call it. It's not the reason why KU lost, but it certainly did not help KU um, in that moment. And it's a, it just so happens that the guy that was off sides is the one that forces the fumble that then KU turns the ball over on downs. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I actually want to talk about a play before that uh, mm. when Daniel Highshaw gets run out of bounds because totally. Kansas got a really good look on that play. And you would just about every day of the week take Daniel Highshaw one on one mm -hmm. with a guy. And I think it was Anthony Goodlow for Oklahoma State made a terrific play to get Daniel Highshaw out of bounds. And, and I think, like I said, we. I realize this is a KU podcast. We look at things from the KU side of things. The other team's going to make plays too. And that was a play that I think if you went to Andy Kotelnicki, if you went to, to Lance Leipold and said, you know what, you're going to have Daniel Highshaw one-on-one with a chance to run over Anthony Goodlow for, for a first down, that, that you would take that. And, and you know, to – to Highshaw's credit, I mean, Highshaw battled. I mean, he tried to throw that guy off, and and he was able to wrestle him out of bounds, mm -hmm. and so that really set up a, a tough fourth down. And I, I think, like I said, that's important to mention because, yes, the offsides would have given Kansas a first down. Yes, it, it would have, you know, given Kansas a chance to run more clock down, different things like that. They would mm -hmm. not yet have been in field goal range. You know, and so that's not necessarily a, a guarantee, especially mm -hmm. with the way they kicked the ball all, all yeah, day long. Well, we got to talk about that. Um, but uh, but the whole reason they even had that play was because Goodlow wrestled, you know, high shot out of bounds in a one-on-one -on -one and really made a great play. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think 
you put it perfectly in that I never want to blame officials for a loss because I think there's always something mm-hmm. that you could have done differently. And so was that a major factor? Did it come in an awful time? Yes. It was, mm-hmm. a, as you could say, a decisive call. It's not why Kansas lost. Kansas had about eight to 10 other chances to win this football game. And we're not oh, even man. talking about them yet. Um, and, and, and didn't win it you know, with those chances. And so I, I think it, it was a big call. It wasn't the call. And you think about when that mm-hmm. call was made or, or not made, I guess. The sack happened, yeah, but Kansas still led. Yeah. It was still 32 to 30 at that point. So, you know, you still had a chance to generate stops. You still had a chance to respond. And I'm sure we're getting ready to, to get to that. Yeah. But... But yeah, that you, we had to talk about the call because that's yeah. you know that's that's the big thing that everybody wants to talk about whenever a call like that happens, and it was a really rough call at that point in time in the game. Yeah, exactly. And then right, Cage defense has a chance to go and and get a stop and and do it, but again, it's another one of these situations where they just can't. And Oklahoma State just kind of bled some of the clock where. You know, then K gets the ball back, and at that point, it's just it. you're asking for um, an offense that has had zero momentum for probably about 30 minutes of real time um, to go and try and cultivate what it had two hours, two and a half hours previous. Like that's just tough to do. So, um, yeah, it was one of those when, when once Oklahoma State uh, scored to make it. I believe that would have been at that point in time. It would have been a four point game. Yep. Um, then you're like, okay, yeah, like this is going to be, it's going to be tough. Um, I did not have the, the utmost faith that it was going to go well. what did you think of the play calling then on the next offensive series where I believe it was pass, 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 run. And one of those passes was almost intercepted or maybe it was run, pass, run. I can't remember these. Yeah, I, I know Bean ran on the first one, but I can't remember if it was an actual run or if it was a pass that. That's he, right. So he it was. Run. So it went. He he scr- he tried to scramble, didn't get anything, and then or maybe it was like one yard. Then second and nine, he throws it, and that's another one of those plays where it was almost intercepted. Try um, almost the, forced it to Mason Fairchild. Yeah, and, exactly. And the and guy bats it down. That's another one of those yeah. alley throws where you're looking at it. Um, in hindsight and saying like, like, I don't know about throwing it there. And then Devin, Neal makes the run on, on third down, right. To get you to fourth and one. And then yeah. Kevin, what'd you think of, what'd you think of the fourth down play call? I honestly, I, I didn't love it. Honestly. And in, in hindsight, it's really easy to say this, but I get that it's, that it's one yard at the same mm-hmm. time. I, I think, when you look at where Kansas had had success, right? It was not running the ball. Mm -hmm. It was not throwing the ball short. Mm -hmm. It was making either those intermediate passes or, or pushing it down the field. And I'm not saying you want to throw a post route on fourth and one, because that's, you know, that that's crazy, but I am saying, you know, Hey, the crosser over the middle, you know, something, that where you can, you know, maybe spread somebody out like that and, and even give Bean a chance to scramble if he really needs to do that. I, I think in that situation, typically I'd say, hey, hand that thing off and, mm-hmm. and run it. I, I do think there's kind of another uh, funny thing to to talk about a little bit uh, that, that came up in this game and it, and it came up in the Texas game. Daniel Highshaw is a really good back. I'm not sure Jason Bean can run RPO with Daniel Highshaw because Highshaw takes that ball right out of his hands. Mm. And you've seen on multiple occasions, Bean has tried to pull that back Mm. because the throw is the right play there. Mm -hmm. And Highshaw just eats the ball anyway. And it made for a really awkward, if you remember, fourth down conversion attempt Mm -hmm. against Texas, where it was like, man, what's, what's the deal? Like, why is Bean tugging the ball against Highshaw? I think that's the tough thing about those situations is Highshaw is going to take that ball from Jason Bean, mm. you know, and, and Bean needs to, you know, 
they need to figure out that exchange because that happened again against Oklahoma State where the throw was the right play to make, but when Bean's trying to pull it, the high shots still took it from him. And I, I think the reason I, I bring that up here is I think ideally you'd run like an RPO, right? Like you would mm-hmm. say, hey, let's run this thing if the run is there and pull it and hit a slant route or something if that's the play that's there. But your best short yardage back is Daniel Hyshaw, and you can't run RPO with Daniel Hyshaw and Jason Bean the way that it's going right now. And so they that exchange is kind of a little thing, but mm-hmm. it's popped up at big moments, I feel like, over the last you know three weeks or so, and, and just something to, to kind of watch. Yeah, so in that fourth down call, that was a play that KU ran against Texas Tech. Yep. on a fourth down that Jared Casey actually scored a touchdown on. And sure. and this time, you know, Oklahoma State made a really good play. They had two guys Jumped right there over. in that throwing alley where he had no shot. And if you look at the line of scrimmage, they really didn't have much of a shot there either. This was one of those where Oklahoma State had the perfect play call for what KU was going to try and do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, the Monday morning quarterback stuff on the actual play calls is hard because it's like, okay, you can come up with a lot of different – Oh, well, let's call this, call this, and maybe it doesn't work. Um, but definitely one of those where in hindsight you're like, ooh, yeah, it didn't look pretty. How about that? That's probably yeah. the, a diplomatic way to say it. it didn't look pretty. Let, um, let me let me ask you this though. Hmm. With after the first interception that Jason Bean threw, Kansas has had success all game pushing the ball down the field. Did you feel like they continued to try and push the, the ball down the field the way that they did before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because there's that throw to Trevor Wilson over the middle that was deep that he Jason Bean just overgunned it. And I think from there, um, Oklahoma State did a really good job. And if you looked at that, that Trevor Wilson play, right, he had yeah. two guys next to him. So it was double covered. And I think Oklahoma State did a good job of adjusting and maybe keeping guys a little deeper. Um and understanding that they've done such a good job of stopping the run that at that point in time that you've got what, you know, probably 50 minutes of we've stopped the run consistently. So now we can maybe take one guy that was run fitting close to the line of scrimmage, drop him back a little bit more to, to cover that. So I think Oklahoma state did a good job of adjusting in that moment. Um, and I think it just resulted in for KU where it was tougher for Jason Bean to do it. They basically, instead of shrinking the field, right? Like they tried to do with stacking the box and leaving space in behind. What they did then was they kind of left more space in the middle, kind of in that intermediate area and kind of forced Jason Bean to try and thread the needle and he couldn't. Um, So I think it's just one of those where it's kind of one of those in-game adjustments where I think KU did a good job of adjusting what Oklahoma State was doing. And then very late in the game, Oklahoma State added another wrinkle that I think was really, really smart. And that happens in football. Right. Sure. Sometimes the opposing coaching staff makes the right adjustment at the right time. And it's almost too late for KU then to adjust. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting question. I, I still think there were maybe other opportunities there, you know, that, you know, not that they needed to continue to play like Tecmo Super Bowl and try and throw the ball, you know, 70 yards every play. But I, I did feel like there were some opportunities there. Maybe you run like a Mills concept or something where you've got a guy going post and then you've got a crossing route coming under where the crossing route, you know, potentially could have opened up or different things like that. But, you know, it, it, it's an interesting question because I, I think after that Wilson throw, you know, I, I'm not sure Kansas tried to push the ball down the field as much, but that's also not necessarily a damning thing, right? Like, if it's not there, why would you do it? Like, and so I, I think it's it's an interesting discussion piece, though. Totally, totally. And then you know, in the end, the offense isn't they don't convert, and Oklahoma State goes and I believe tax on the field goal at that point, and then seven point game with fifteen seconds left, something like that, and you're not going to win much um, or have many opportunities. And Kate didn't have a uh, a West Virginia or Houston mm-hmm. moment in them, um, so. Looking ahead now, obviously bye week, um, but does this game change much of your opinion about KU as a team for this year? No, not necessarily. And I think, you know, J- 
Jason Bean really did play a great game. You don't throw for 410 yards and, and five touchdowns, you know, without having a great game. But I also think, and, and I'm not saying he's immune to criticism or, or anything like that. I think people need to be cognizant of the fact that he's Kansas's backup and that he's Kansas's backup for, for a reason. And part of that reason is that Jalen Daniels is really, really good. Uh, but you look at it last year when Oklahoma went into the Texas game without Dylan Gabriel, they got shut out. I mean, yeah, their right. quarterback, lo- their quarterback looked like he hadn't seen college football before. You know, you look at Oklahoma state last year when they came to Lawrence without Spencer Sanders. I mean, that quarterback play was really, really, really rough. And so I do think that it's important to put Bean's performances into perspective and say, man, if you thought your backup quarterback was going to go into Stillwater and throw for 410 yards, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a terrific performance. I also think, like I said, that Oklahoma state to some extent bet sort of, Hey, we got to choose run or pass, you know, the pass is the thing that, that ultimately might not beat mm-hmm. us. The flip side of all of that is you score 32 points, you put up, you know, 500, you know, yards of offense or, or whatever Kansas finished with, you know, it's maybe not entirely on the offense. Although I think we can say that with how many plays the defense faced with all of those different things, it really, really, really would have helped the defense out if the offense could have had even one sustained drive sort of in the clutch of this game when it was decided. Yeah. For me, it's, it just kind of reinforces the complimentary football aspect of it where K just has to play better. And I think across the board, it was kind of like at the end of the day, when the game is over, you look back and say, okay, offense, probably a C plus, I think, you know, good moments, but lack of consistency and turnovers, Maybe if you said B minus, I'd say, okay, Um, you put up 32 points. That's positive. I'd say C minus probably for the defense. They got stops in the middle of the game, right? And it just so happens that those stops coincided with the KU's offense kind of starting to struggle a little bit, right? Where there was kind of that succession where there was maybe like four straight punts, if I remember right, something like that. And then you look at special teams and KU misses point after touchdowns and leaves points on the board and – you look at the score before the final field goal, a four-point game. How many points did K leave up on the board in point after touchdown situations? Three to four. Yep. You know, and you're looking at it being a different game if KU has those points. So it, it's it's a huge difference because you you, know, you were just talking about your feeling about and not feeling confident that KU was going to come back and and scored that game-winning touchdown when they went down four. All of a sudden, you had three extra points where you're down one, and you only need a field goal rather Mm -hmm. than a touchdown. I think you feel a lot more comfortable in that situation. I think Jason Bean feels a lot more comfortable in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think the offense in general feels a lot more comfortable in that situation where it's we don't have to go all the way down the field and get in the end zone here. If we can, you know, stack a few first downs together, next thing you know, we're going to be fairly close to field goal range and, and have a chance to to walk this thing off. Instead of it being 36 to 35, you know, it's it's 36 to 32. You have to have that touchdown. And it just seems like so much a taller task at that point. Yeah, exactly. And so collectively, right, if you give this a performance a, a grade, I'd probably say C, you know, like – you got to be better on the road. Right. And I think that's the next step for the program right now, where you look back at some of these road games, um, Austin, bad, Nevada, pretty bad. Right. I think in terms of comparison for what we thought going in, go back to last year, right. You know, Kansas state diabolical special teams, Texas tech, not good enough. Slow start. Like KU right now has been really good at home. They made it. Memorial Stadium, a tough play to go and play. And I just think being more consistent on the road is the next step. And I think that comes with more confidence. Um, 
I wouldn't say maturity, but just the ability to kind of continue working at it. And I think you saw bits and pieces of that during this game, and you saw bits and pieces of it last year in some of the games KU came back and won on the road early in the season. But when KU has played equal opponents or better on the road, it doesn't feel like they, they've played up to that level. Um, of the opposition. And so that's just another area for the program to work on and continue to try and get better at. And I think that the Iowa state road game is going to be a really big test because they're playing a lot better right now. You know, they have figured some things out and Ames is not an easy place to go play. And Iowa state runs that three, three, five defense. They're right. That is a perfect chance to show if you've grown from this loss. So I won't know if KU has gotten better from this until the first week of November which sucks to say when we're <laughs> three weeks away from it, but it's just kind of the fact of the matter, right? It, we're, we'll know more about this loss the first week of November when they go to Ames. Did they learn from it? You know, yeah. it's not sexy to say, but it's it's the fact of the matter. Yeah, and I, I know we try to keep this thing about football and, and separate it from basketball, but mm -hmm. – um, I was talking to Lon Kruger one time about KU basketball and, and why they win so many close games. And he said, it, it's simple. He goes, when it, when it comes down to a close game, he goes, my guys think they can win. Kansas knows it's going to win. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you look at going back to football, when you look at it, when Kansas sort of started to churn over toward the orange bowl and things like that, they started adding a lot of guys to the program who had, you know, just extreme, you know, they won a lot in high school. And that doesn't sound like much, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, if you're a good player, you know, you you probably won a lot or whatever. Des Briscoe won a state title, you know, at, at a really high level in Texas. Guys like that who came in and, and they knew they were going to win as opposed to hoping that they could win or thinking that they could win. And I think you talking about, you know, maturity, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like a maturity of confidence in that they need to have a result like to go to Iowa State and, and show up and play an A game and execute and everything to where after that, their confidence can kind of mature to where they can sit there and say next time they go into a road game, we know we're going to win this. We have been here before and we've won this. And, and I think... I think that's kind of where they're at right now is they believe they can win on the road. I, I have no doubt that they felt in the fourth quarter like like they probably were going to beat Oklahoma State. But mm -hmm. there's a difference between thinking and knowing, and I think that that's kind of where they need to get from this point. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think it's a good place to, to wrap it up. I'm sure we'll talk more by week in second half of the season next week. Cause we got to save some stuff for next Sunday. Cause yeah, there's not yeah gonna I, be figured, I figured next Sunday we, we get on here and, and kind of talk first half of the season, et cetera, and yeah. where things are going to go. And we don't want to deprive people of the, of the Sunday podcast just because there's no game uh, on that Saturday, but uh, should be a, should be a good time. And uh, I, I'm going to definitely tell uh Ryan Wallace, that this is the week he needs to get after you for for more local <laughs> recruiting podcasts as well. Because uh, I've got time to burn, Kevin. There, there you I've go. Got time let's, to let's burn on that thing. So it's the bye week. I love it. <laughs> it should be fun. I, you yeah. know what? And I, I mentioned at the beginning this is going to be. We're, we're back on the Sunday schedule. Guess what we're doing next week? Yep. We got to go Monday because I'm not going to be in town. Yep, that's. That's the way it happens sometimes, but uh, uh, we'll get back yeah, on it. At some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's way too fun a season. And, and I think, you know, as disappointing as, as this loss is and the fact that, you know, a, a lot of the fact that Kansas had a, had a real chance to win it and, and pull that thing out. Even so, if somebody would have said, Hey, through the first seven games, you're five and two probably would have taken that before the season started. And so, it's uh, it's an interesting season from from here on out because there there aren't a whole lot of gimmies, but we'll see what happens. Kevin, you know who predicted K to be five and two at this point? I'm guessing with you. the exact with the exact games, right? Uh, I'm guessing you. Now, don't listen to me on the don't listen to me on the back half of the schedule because that's not where it gets fun. That's where I get Twitter hate. But so far, 
Meanwhile, I was I, meanwhile I was chirping to our desk guys before the season even started, saying Kansas is going to win in Stillwater. Kansas is going to win this. Co- Cody Nagel is on our desk who did oh, yeah, such a, who did such a great job, you know, covering Oklahoma State mm-hmm. and, or handing that off to McLean. But uh, but I was telling Cody, you know, when uh, when Oklahoma State started off kind of rough and when the South Alabama game happened and everything, hey. Kansas is going to win this year. Kansas is going to win in Stillwater this year. Just, just wasn't to be. Good coaches figure it out, you know. And I think that's the thing with KU and in, in, in Leipold and this staff, where I, I think at this point there's enough built up where I think there's just a feeling of yeah, areas of this game got away from KU, but I, I they'll figure it out and they'll be able to sure some of this stuff up. Some of it is going to take another off season, right? I think some of the more depth, improving just the overall quality of the roster. It's going to take time, but I think in terms of adjustments, play calls, time and place, I think that'll improve. Um, so that's what makes football exciting. That's what makes K football exciting now, Kevin, because we're not talking about, oh, wow, K, you just lost 55 to 13. Um, what do we take away from this game? It's K, you lost a one score game in a Big 12 um, road atmosphere. It's going to happen. A lot of teams yep. are going to do it this year. So, that's what I got. Any other final thoughts from you, Kevin? No, no, I think we're good. Look, looking forward to next Monday, I guess, <laughs> instead of Sunday. So we get back on Sunday schedule and then flip it back to Monday. Yeah. But I'll take looking, the point. Uh, looking forward to uh, to breaking down the bye week and and then where Kansas is going to go against Oklahoma. I think that could be a more interesting game maybe than people think for a lot of different reasons. Hmm. I love it. Well, thanks as always for listening to the fog.net podcast. If you're listening on the podcast platform of your choice, make sure you're dropping us um, a five-star rating and a review. Those do go a long way in helping us reach more people so they can find out about all the interesting things that Kevin has to say and the uninteresting (laughs) things that I have to say. So also, Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're liking the videos, commenting, um, subscribing to the channel. We'll continue as we get through the next half of the season and obviously big 12 basketball media days are this week. So plenty of content to come from that, but thank you as always. And we will talk to you all next week.